Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Ultrasound and Contraception, presented by Dr. Khaled Sakal. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to identify and characterize permanent female sterilization microinserts, localize intrauterine devices, and understand the utility of 3D ultrasound and contraceptive device imaging. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Khaled Sakal, Darcy Belita Luna have no disclosures. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Khaled Sakel. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, the AIUM webinar series. And uh, today, our topic is ultrasound and contraception. My name is Khaled Sakel. Um, and I just wanted to put a plug in for AIUM. If you are not already a member, I hope that you will consider becoming a member. You will find really a treasure of information related to ultrasound and become really connected with folks who are like-minded like yourself, highly interested in, uh, in ultrasound. So by the end of this session, we're gonna be able to um, identify and characterize permanent female sterilization microinserts, localize intrauterine devices, and understand the utility of 3D ultrasound in contraceptive device imaging. We're gonna be talking uh, mainly about the metallic, micro, uh, metallic sterilization microinserts. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly about the silicone sterilization microinserts and talk about IUDs, both the um, hormonal and the non-hormonal type of IUDs. We're gonna start with, uh, with the metallic microinsert and the one that's currently available in, in, on the market is Eshore, which is made by Bayer. The Eshore permanent contraceptive uh, uh, microinsert was first approved in, uh, in 2002 in the United States by the FDA. It is metallic and uh, the procedure is accomplished uh, hysteroscopically. And um, typically it is an office procedure performed under local anesthesia with uh, possibly per percervical block or some form of sedation in some offices. Each metallic microinsert is housed inside a delivery catheter and consists of two coils, an outer coil and an inner coil. The outer coil anchors the device within the proximal fallopian tube in the region of the cornua. The inner coil is coated with polyethylene terephthalate or PET fibers that stimulate the fibrosis. The inner coil is made of uh, stainless steel. Then appropriate deployment of the microinsert inside the tube occurs when three to eight of the 26 coils are visible inside the cavity, as you can see on, on this uh, schematic here, as you, and as you can see here inside the um, uh, uterus on hysteroscopy. Three months after the hysteroscopic sterilization, um, it, it is required that the patient undergo a confirmation test. 
and the patient is required to use backup birth control for those three months until that test is performed. The confirmation can be in the form of a modified hysterosalpingography or in certain patients that meet, meet eligibility criteria, a transvaginal ultrasound can be offered. The, um, the manufacturer of, uh, of the metallic microinsert uh, asks that, pay, that providers get some form of training um, to, to be able to perform these um, transvaginal ultrasound confirmation tests. The, the microinsert has four radio-opaque markers located at the proximal and distal portion of the outer and inner coils. The proximal portions of both of uh, both the inner and the outer coils should be in the expected location uh, in the um, uterine cornua. And here you can see the um, the, the four um, um, markers of the uh, microinsert: the proximal air, proximal portion and the distal portion. For the HSG protocol. Tubal occlusion is confirmed by using um, an intrauterine injection of the contrast that is uh, injected at a low rate, so very slowly, with low pressure, and according to the device manufacturer, includes six radiographs, a scout scan, a minimal fill, partial fill, total fill with maximum distension of the cornua, and then two magnified views of each uterine cornua. Here you can see the uh, hysterosalpingogram with partial fill. You can see the um, cornua and each um, uh, uh, microinsert. And here you can see a complete fill with the microinserts at each cornua. And again, you can see a complete fill of, uh, of the hysterosalpingogram. You can see the four markers. And you can see how the, um, the proximal markers are in the cornua of the right side and the cornua of the left side. And you can see the four uh, markers on each side. In this hysterosalpingogram, uh, we see that on the left side, you can see the four markers of the um, eshore, and uh, you can see that the left eshore is starting at the cornua. However, on the right side, we cannot observe the microinsert and that the right fallopian tube is, is uh, patent with spillage. On this hysterosalpingogram, you can see that the, um, the uh, uh, microinsert is slightly distal to the cornua, but still within the cornual area. However, on the right side, you can see that it is slightly uh, further away um, than, on the, than on the left side. For TVU confirmation test eligibility and to be able to offer the patient's uh, transvaginal ultrasound for confirmation instead of hysterosalpingogram, then the patient should satisfy a number of, uh, of criteria. There should be no concern at the time of placement of possible perforation, no difficulty identifying the tubal uh, ostia, provider is certain about placement, procedure time should be less than 15 minutes, one to eight trailing calls for each insert, and no unusual post-operative pain, and patients should not be on an active immunosuppressive therapy. The TBU protocol requires at least three images, a scout in the mid-transverse plane showing both inserts, and then a right and left oblique transverse showing the length of each. To classify, each one, to classify the transvaginal ultrasound confirmation test, it is classified as optimal when the proximal edge of each insert starts at the cornwall endometrium and the insert goes past the serosa of the uterotubal junction. It is satisfactory if the proximal edge of the insert is beyond the corneal uh, endometrium, but within the corneal myometrium, and the insert goes past the serosa of the uterotubal junction. It is unsatisfactory if the dis if, if it is di if the um, if distal proximal end of the insert is past the corneal myometrial edge or if the proximal majority of the insert is more than 50% inside the cavity, or if perforation is suspected, such that if the linear axis of the insert is parallel to the axis of the endometrium, if expulsion of one or both are noted in the endometrial cavity, and unclassified such as coiling of the um, insert. In such cases where, where you think it is unsatisfactory 
then the, the recommendation is for the patient to go ahead and perform a hysterosalpingogram, which is always a backup for the transvaginal ultrasound confirmation test. Non-visualization of the device within the proximal fallopian tube suggests that it may have, it may be too distal, it may be expulsed or perforated. And again, in these instances, further imaging warranted with hysterosalpingogram. Drawbacks of hysterosalpingogram as compared to the transvaginal ultrasound would be cost, radiation exposure to both patient and provider, need for a radioscopy suite, patient inconvenience, pain, infection, and bleeding. Other imaging modalities such as plain film x-ray, um, CT and MRI, and even HSC, the microinsert appears as a linear radio-opaque structure within the four radio, with, with the four radiographic markers. Although the, the, uh, the microinsert can be detected on plain film x-ray, the proper positioning within the fallopian tube cannot be confirmed, as you can see on this x-ray. You can see the microinserts. However, their relation to the soft tissue cannot be confirmed. It's difficult to ascertain proper positioning of the microinsert, again, with the fallopian tube on CT or MRI, despite adequate visualization, as you can see in these images, where you can see the microinserts very well, you can see the uterus, and again here, you can see both microinserts and the uterus, but it is difficult to ascertain their proper positioning within the fallopian tube. 3D ultrasound image can appear to have an advantage um, in that you are able to see the proximal edge of the microinsert in relation to the coronal plane of the endometrial cavity. As you can see in this image here, where you can see the top of the fundus here, you can see the microinsert on the right side here, and on the left side here, you can see the proximal edge, how it relates to the endometrial cavity at the corner on each side. Legendre um, and, and, and other and, uh, colleagues uh, published in 2010 a way to evaluate metallic microinserts, and they suggested this classification system. They evaluated 64 metallic microinserts in 33 patients at that three month after insertion using both HSG and 3D ultrasound. And this, uh, taken from their from their publication, um, shows that. Uh, there's one, two, and three uh, 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 positions, and if the microinsert uh, goes, one would be in, inside the endometrium, two is myometrial, and three past the uterotubal uh, junction. And so um, these would be the, uh, the the perfect position would be if it if the microinsert goes from one, two, and three. It's proximal if it goes just from one to two. It is distal if it's two and three, and it is very distal if it is just three. They found that 48 microinserts were in satisfactory position on ultrasound, and all showed tubal occlusion on HSG. The remaining 16 microinserts were too distal in the three only position on ultrasound. And three of these 16 devices showed tubal patency on HSG compared with the other three positions. So it was 18% in those three versus zero in the others. So let's look at a few cases. Here you can see on transvaginal ultrasound, you can see the um, uh, in, in mid transverse, slightly oblique. You can see the um, endometrium here. You can see the right microinsert going, going starting at the um, uh, coronal endometrium going through the myometrium and past the uterotubal serosal junction, which is right here. On the left side, similarly, you can see the endometrium. You can see that this uh, microinsert begins at the uh, endometrium and goes past the uterotubal serosal junction um, for an optimal positioning. And here it is on a 3D image. You see how both microinserts start at the um, coronal endometrium and then go past the uterotubal serosal junction on each side. Here again, you can see the um, uterus, the endometrium is here, a little bit of uh, fluid there. You can see that the uh, microinsert starts here and goes uh, and goes past the uterotubal serosal junction. And on this side, similarly starts just slightly distal, it seems, on, on this side, and then goes past that uterotubal serosal junction. On, uh, on 3D, you can see better um, appreciate the, um, the relation of the microinsert to the endometrium 
And this is what it looked like on HSG. You can see that um, the, um, the micro inserts do start at the um, coronal area. Both tubes are um, blocked. And again, you can see here on mid transfers, you see um, the, the, mid, uh, the, the endometrium, you see the, uh, uh, the macro inserts on both sides. You see the, uh, this side going, starting at the endometrium and going past the uditubal serosal junction, which is right here. And on the, on the left side, you can see it starts at the coronal endometrium and then goes past the uditubal serosal junction here. And this is what it looks like on 3D. The, um, the um, micro insert starts um, at the coronal endometrium and goes past the uditubal serosal junction and same thing on the um, on this side. On this and this patient, you can see that the um, endometrium here and the left side it's um, it's just at the um, coronal endometrium. However, on the right side it's perhaps just uh, distal to it, but if you if you um, do the um, 3D image, however, you, th you you notice that it is not actually um, inside the endometrium, and this was a um, just past the endometrium here on the on the on, on the left side because it's a retroverted uterus, and on the right side you see that it's actually perfectly placed and touches the um, endometrium on that on that right side. You see here on, on this, uh, on this uh, mid, trans, mid, mid uh, sagittal plane uh, where you start looking for the, for the um, micro inserts, should they be uh, linear axis here, then you're suspecting that they may be um, uh, malpositioned as, uh, as micro inserts. Um, this is the mid transverse. You see it appropriately, you see both uh, uh, micro inserts. You see it on the on this on this side that it starts off touching the um, endometrium on the on the right side and goes past the tubal serosal junction and same thing on the left side and this is what it looks like on 3D very appropriately placed um, on both uh, both sides. Now we're going to start seeing a little more about uh, along the satisfactory location where they're a little further distal uh, but still within the um, coronal myometrium. So you can see here that the uterus, um, you can see the endometrium, you see that the right eshore is a little further away from the, uh, from the endometrium, but still within the myometrial portion. The left side may be a, a little closer to the endometrium, and you can see on ultrasound similar picture that the left side does touch the, um, the endometrium, the right side just distal, um, but still within a satisfactory location, and this is what it looks like on hysterosalpingogram. You see the left side does start at the um, endometrium. The right side starts a little distal from, uh, from the right uh, coronal endometrium, but both are, are blocked and in satisfactory location. Again, similarly on this, on this case where um, the, um, the eshore is a little uh, distal to the um, coronal endometrium, but within the myometrium, um, and same thing on, on this side. So it's, it's more of a bilateral situation. In this situation, you start to see a little more of the micro insert in the mid sagittal plane. So you're concerned a little bit about that micro insert. You look at the right side, right side looks, looks okay. Looks like it starts at the coronal edge of the endometrium and goes past the uterotubal serosal junction. But you're now a little concerned on that left side and how it appeared already in the mid sagittal plane. And you can see here, that the right side looks appropriate. The left side seems a little more proximal than, uh, than you would like, but it does go past the uretubal serosal junction and goes out. Um, and this is what it looks like on 3D. So the right side looks appropriate. The, th the left side, maybe a little more of that micro insert than you'd like to see, but it's still satisfactory because not more than 50% of it. And it still goes past the uteral tubal serosal um, junction. In this case, where you're looking at the uterus and the endometrium, you don't see any uh, micro insert here in the myometrium. You see it actually outside of the uterus here, kind of like parallel to the uterus, and that is a concern for perforation. The left side seems to be in a satisfactory location. Here's the endometrium, and it seems to be just a little distal to the endometrium, but uh, in a satisfactory, but this is concerning for uh, a, a perforation. This is what it looks like on 3D. 
where you see the, my, the uh, myometrial edges here, and you see that that um, microinsert is almost parallel to the myometrial edge, the, um, and, and then the other microinsert was, uh, was pretty um, normal. And this is what it looked like on, on uh, hysterosalpingogram uh, scout. You see the, um, the left side looks okay, the right side maybe a little more distal, but as you inject, you see that the, the uh, microinsert is maybe uh, perpendicular to the uh, normal um, trajectory of that, uh, of that fallopian tube, and it is a, a perforation. And, and again, here you see that um, you're looking for the microinsert. You don't see it anywhere inside the uh, myometrial edge. Here's the endometrium, and you don't see anything. You, you're seeing it outside here on this side. On the left side, you see it close to the um, endometrial edge in the um, cornwall region. On, um, on, on 3D ultrasound, you see the right eshore is, is totally outside. The left eshore is somewhat slightly within the um, uh, coronal myometrium, so kind of satisfactory on the left. Right side um, is, seems to be uh, outside and suspicious of perforation. And then you look at the hysterosalpingogram, you see that the left side is in fact just a little distal, but it is in an appropriate location and blocked. The right side seems to be completely away from the, uh, from the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube trajectory would be here, and the issue is completely outside of that trajectory. And this was um, a perforation. And then sometimes you see that the, the microinsert is just not linear. It's, it's coiled, and that's not a satisfactory location. Of, uh, and so you can see here on the right side, you see the um, hyperechogenic structure is, is coiled. It's, it's circular rather than being linear. The left side, we start to see it here. This is what it looks like on 3D. You see the, um, the, uh, the microinsert on the left side is, uh, is linear and going starting from the endometrium, going past the urotubal cerebral junction. On the right side, you see that it is uh, circular, kind of coiled. This is unsatisfactory. Um, and in some cases, you'll, you'll find that the, the, the microinsert is, uh, is broken, as in, as in this case, where the patient had a difficult um, insertion an attempt uh, by the provider was to, to, re to remove it, um, and she was not able to remove it. And, um, and uh, so the, the uh, microinsert broke, and this is what you see um, if it's a fractured microinsert, and obviously that's not a satisfactory uh, situation. We're going to briefly mention Ariana permanent contraception just because it was available uh, from 2009 until 2012. And so there are uh, a lot of patients that are um, young women that are still um, uh, walking around and have uh, Ariana. Ariana was a, uh, was a permanent contraceptive system that was uh, uh, marketed by Hologic. And then it came off the market in 2012 for financial uh, reasons. It's basically a five millimeter silicone pellet that is uh, placed into the intramural portion of the fallopian tube after that portion of the fallopian tube is, um, is, 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 is you create a, a, what they called a lesion with greater frequency um, ablation of the tube, and then you deposited the silicone in that place to form the, um, the fibrotic plug. And this is what it looks like on a, on a schematic, uh, where the um, silicone pellets are, are uh, similarly by hysteroscopy uh, deposited after you do the radio frequency uh, lesion. And this is what they look like. On mid-transverse, you see that they are hyperechogenic, uh, sh uh, small, and they have that uh, multiple linear hyperechogenicity uh, kind of shadow uh, behind them. And again, this is what they look like here and here, slightly more distal than the, uh, the other one, but this is what they look like um, um, on, on uh, ultrasound. And this is on 3D ultrasound. You see how, it, how it's uh, deposited inside the cornwall region of the fallopian tube and hyperechogenic um, on that side. We're going to move on at this time to, uh, to talk about um, intrauterine uh, devices. The intrauterine device is the most popular reversible form of contraception with 168 million users worldwide. Adoption in the United States has been slower than the rest of the world, and partly that had to do with um, with complications with older IUDs, such as the Lippies loop and the progestocert, where there was a lot of uh, um, symptomatology in terms of uh, bleeding and increased risk of uh, ectopic pregnancies. Um, but uh, the, the most recent US national health statistic estimates that 5% of women um, are uh, using contraception opt for an IUD placement, 
which is really, uh, which is uh, an increase from 1995, where it was about 0.8 percent. So we're headed in the right direction. There are um, a number of IUDs that are uh, uh, available in the United States. Um, we have the hormonal IUDs and the non-hormonal IUDs. For the hormonal IUDs, it's a, it's a levonorgestrel hormone releasing IUD system. We have the Marina, which is produced by Bayer, and those and the Marina, which is uh, uh, a 32 by 32 millimeter IUD. Um, Skyla, also produced by Bayer, um, and uh, that's a three-year uh, IUD. The Marina was a five, uh, Marina is a five-year IUD. The Skyla is a three-year IUD, IUD and, and measures 28 millimeters by 30 millimeters. Um, Kylina. Uh, produced by Bayer is a uh, five-year IUD uh, and also smaller size, 28 millimeters by 30 millimeters. And then there's also Liletta that's uh, produced by Allergan and in collaboration with uh, with Medicines uh, 360. And it's also a 32 by 32 millimeter uh, IUD and the most uh, and it's a four-year IUD. But they're working on increasing that to I believe five years um, uh, through the FDA. And then we have the non-hormonal copper releasing IUD system, and that's the Paragard produced by Cooper Surgical, um, and that's a 32 millimeter by 36 millimeters. So the second uh, value is the length of the um, shaft of the IUD. And this is a schematic that's um, um, that shows the um, the IUD. So uh, this is this would be the T-shaped copper type IUD, which which has the copper coils, uh, which are very hyper on ultrasound. And this is what the, um, um, the hormone uh, releasing IUDs look like um, and the shaft that, that houses the uh, reservoir for the, for the hormone. Um, and then this is an older um, IUD, the Lippies Loop, which we, you know, we hardly ever see now, except if it's somebody that forgot about it for over a decade or so. Um, and then these circular IUDs were mo mostly in China. Um, so if you have a patient that you know recently emigrated, maybe have, has had a, an IUD inserted a long time ago in, in China, maybe you'll see one of those. The shaft of the IUD is easily identifiable sonographically as a linear echogenic structure for both types of, um, of IUDs. The arms of the copper IUD are usually fully visualized and echogenic. The arms of the levonorgestrel releasing IUDs are not as echogenic and can be a challenge to visualize on 2D ultrasound. The IUD threads are also hyperechogenic and can be visualized. So this is what the IUD um, looks like. It's a linear echogenic structure. It's easily identifiable on, on, on 2D. Um, 3D ultrasound has really been gaining ground and been gaining popularity for IUD localization since it provides better characterization of the arms and the threads of the IUD, including the levonorgestrel IUD. And here you can see the threads the IUD up here, and you can see the IUD threats coming down here through the um, through the cervix. So sonography of the IUD, you know, can, can also come in handy um, in difficult visualization situations. So 3D ultrasound can be really handy, such as such as this situation. So um, in this situation where you're seeing that there is a fibroid. And you know that there's an IUD inside that uterus and you're, you're wanting to see it and you try to, to manipulate your probe to try to visualize. You're seeing some areas of hyperechogenicity, but still not able to visualize an IUD. Try to put an IUD, uh, try to do a 3D, IUD, 3D um, ultrasound and then you'll be able to see perhaps a little better the, um, the IUD that's over here. You can see the, uh, sitting, the IUD sitting here on the, on the side and being pushed by this fibroid off to, um, to, the, to the lateral aspect of this, uh, of, of this uh, uterus. The incidence of uh, malposition. So the precise incidence of malposition in all IUD users is really not known. Uh, it's likely to be higher than what is generally thought due, due to the more frequent use of uh, 3D ultrasonography. And it, it can be as high as 25%. But it all depends on the population that studied, you know, why the patient had her ultrasound in the first place, symptomatology. So, but but having having a real understanding of what the incidence in the general population, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, is difficult to 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 know. But uh, in this uh, prospective study that utilized 3D ultrasound evaluation on 413 women who had levonorgestrel IUD insertion or replacement, they found that one or both arms were suspected to be embedded in more than 50% of cases at that six weeks post-insertion ultrasound. So that's a pretty high number 
but that includes uh, both sympt uh, sympt symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. And uh, one thing that we have to we have, we have to realize is that continuation rate of IUDs is 50% for liver and gestural IUD and 40% for copper IUDs at five years. Now, obviously, it's not it's not all because of symptoms. Some people just decide they want to get pregnant or they just want to have the IUD removed. But the continuation rate is still around 50%, which tells us that there you know IUDs can have uh, problems with malpositioning or symptomatology. So where are the malpositioned IUDs? So a retrospective study of 182 women with malpositioned IUDs, um, uh, they, they, they noted that 73% were in the lower urine segment or cervix, 11.5% were embedded and or rotated, 7% were expelled, 7% were intraperitoneal, and then 19% with more than one type of malpositioning. And here you can see the, um, this patient that actually was, was pregnant, which is why she uh, came, but she knew she had an, uh, an IUD. Uh, the IUD could not be visualized inside the uterus, and the IUD was actually in the pararectal space right here, and you can see it uh, as a linear echogenic structure um, in the pararectal space. What is the malpositioned IUD? So what are the definitions? A displaced IUD is located in the lower uterine segment or cervix, or it can be rotated. So the longitudinal axis of the IUD is not parallel to the axis of the uterine cavity. An embedded IUD is where one or both arms are impinging on the myometrium, but not penetrating through the uterine serosa. An expulsed IUD is, is when either completely ex, uh, expulsed through the cervix or partial where the IUD is partly in the cervix and partly in the uterus. And then a perforated IUD is, is one that's protruding through the uterine serosa or completely outside the uterus and within the abdominal peritoneal cavity. If the IUD is not visualized on ultrasound, then an X-ray should be recommended. As in this case, where we, we, ha we had a patient that presented and uh, she, ha she uh, had an IUD, we looked for it on ultrasound. This is on 2D ultrasound. You see there's no um, linear echogenic structure within the endometrium. We did a 3D ultrasound, and again, we were not able to see any T-shape or anything uh, hyperechogenic. And so an X-ray was performed and showed that the IUD was, in fact, um, um, in, the, in the peritoneal cavity, obviously sitting in this position. It, can, it, it, it cannot be inside the uterus. Uh, and this is uh, the IUD um, upon laparoscopic uh, removal. It was, uh, it was housed by uh, a little bit of uh, omentum and easily um, removed. What are some side effects of malpositioned IUDs? Well, they can be asymptomatic, and probably most of the times they are asymptomatic. Um, abnormal uterine bleeding, pelvic pain, dyspareunia, and there's always the potential impact on contraceptive uh, efficacy. But I think one of, one of the areas that's uh, always in question is what is displacement? What, how can I um, define displacement? What is too far from the um, fundus of the uh, of the endometrium? Where is it? At, where is it so abnormal that you have to in, you have to intervene? Those are questions that we're going to try to tackle um, in today's uh, webinar. So, an appropriately placed um, IUD obviously is one that you look and you see that's inside the um, the endometrial cavity, touches the top of the fundus, um, and in a patient that's uh, that's asymptomatic, you do a 3D ultrasound, you see that the T shape is completely touching the, um, the top of the endometrial cavity. Um, here you see the IUD strings kind of coming down through the, um, the cervix down here, a very well uh, appropriately placed IUD. So what is displacement? So you see here the slight displacement of this um, IUD down below the, um, the level of the, uh, of the endometrium. Is this displacement? Um, is this abnormal? Um, it, it, should something be done to, uh, to intervene to, to fix this uh, IUD? Is this displacement where it's slightly even more further, further down? This is a copper shaped, uh, copper um, uh, IUD, a little further down from the endometrium. Um, is this displacement where, uh, where, where we're going further down from the, um, from, from the uh, fundus of, of the uh, of the uterus, uh, the fundal uh, area of the uh, of the cavity, and on 3D you can see it's now slightly impinging on the myometrium here uh, on this side. It's a little lower than than the other ones, but still within the endometrial cavity. So is this displacement? 
And is this one displacement, where you, you know that it's, it's a little low, it's, it's down uh, closer to the lower part of the uterine segment, and maybe perhaps a little bit into the cervix. Um, here you see it's like 1.3 centimeters away from the uh, top of the um, endometrial cavity. Um, is this displacement? Or is this displacement where it's now, uh, most of it some, is, uh, is inside the um, cervical canal, and now we're like probably around two centimeters below the level of the uh, endometrial cavity. I think those, those are really the, the questions that we, 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 we uh, struggle with. Um, you look here on 2D, you see the, um, the um, echogenicity of a marina IUD is down closer to the, um, to the cervix. Here's a, a C-section scar niche. You see that there's maybe uh, a small uh, fibroid um, here at, uh, uh, or, or perhaps a, a polyp. Um, on 3D, it's, it looks more round, so it's more, uh, more likely to be a, a fibroid. And you can see that the shadow, the only, we're looking here at the shadow of the IUD, and the shadow of the IUD is now noted to be within the cervical canal. And here's your C-section scar um, over here. And, and it may not have to be a displaced IUD for it to, to uh, malfunction or, or, um, or have a pregnancy failure. Um, such as this patient where the, the uh, copper IUD is, uh, is inside the cavity and this patient ends up getting pregnant on the copper IUD. Um, you can see the IUD strings are coming down. It's, it's appropriately placed uh, for the most part, but it, it had a pregnancy failure. So nothing is 100%. IUDs we know are 99% effective, so they are very effective, but can have failures. So, this, uh, Go Lightly and, and, um, and their colleagues um, did a survey uh, on providers in the United Kingdom and Australia, and they showed that 90% of providers would remove and replace a copper IUD that was totally or partially in the cervical canal. 45% of providers would replace um, a copper IUD that was more than two centimeters before, below the fundus, and 10% of providers would replace a copper IUD if it was one to two centimeters below the fundus. And this, the numbers were similar for levonorgestrel uh, releasing IUDs. So you can see that different people believe different things about the, the mouth positioning of IUDs. PETA and, um, and, 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 and their colleagues uh, looked at 235 women with copper IUD that had a vaginal ultrasound. If identified as having a misplaced IUD, then it was removed. And then they were compared to 201 age and parity matched women with IUD who no ultrasound, uh, with no ultrasound as a control group. And then they had a one-year follow-up. And the finding was the expulsion rate was significantly higher in the control group. Those patients that did not have an ultrasound, the expulsion rate was higher. However, many IUDs, they note, uh, may have been removed unnecessarily. Morales and, and, and et al., they looked at uh, 32 uh, patients deemed to, to have a low insertion T-shaped uh, IUDs and evaluated within two months of insertion. And it was noted that over time, the low insertion T-shape tended to move upward after uh, by around six millimeters. And the conclusion was that initial concern about low placement IUDs is not justification for removal as most of them spontaneously readjust their position and tended to move upward. Pakirinan, um, they did a randomized control trial uh, on 151 uh, women that had um, levonorgestrel releasing IUD placed intracervically, and then 147 that were placed in the uterine fundus. And after five years of follow-up, there were no differences between the two groups in terms of pregnancy rates. This seems to indicate that the levonorgestrel IUD is effective no matter where it is placed, as long as it's inside the uterine cavity. And this would make sense since the, uh, the main mechanism of action is thickening of the uh, cervical mucus. We don't have that kind of a randomized trial for the copper IUD, so we can make you know, strong recommendations, uh, but we're gonna look at um, some, some other uh, retrospective uh, uh, studies. So, Fadil Oglu uh, looked at um, 284 patients with copper IUD at insertion and at six and at 12 weeks after insertion. Transvaginal ultrasonographic measurement of the uterine dimensions were as follows. So the distance from the uh, IUD tip to the endometrium is called um, IUD endometrium. From the IUD tip to the um, uh, start of the myometrium is called IUD myometrium. 
and then from the IUD to the um, serosa is called IUD fundus. And um, they noted that 16 uh, patients or 5.6% had partial or complete IUD expulsion before the follow-up. Uh, Menorrhagia uh, was noted uh, um, shorter uterine length, so it was 54 versus 60 uh, millimeters. So those patients that had menorrhagia had shorter uterine length. Uh, in patients that had dysmenorrhea, there was no difference in uterine length. And as far as the pelvic cramping as a symptom, all distances from the tip of the IUD were significantly longer in patients who reported the cramping at 12 weeks, showing a downward movement of that IUD. And their conclusion was a shorter IUD, uh, a, shorter a shorter uterine cavity length seems to be a predictor of menorrhagia in patients with a copper IUD. And patients uh, experiencing pelvic cramping with IUD are more susceptible for IUD expulsion as the downward movement of IUD is more prominent in these patients. Fundus uh, did a case control study on uh, 481 patients with copper IUD for at least six months. 236 women had pain and or bleeding compared to 246, uh, 45 uh, asymptomatic. The distances IUD endometrium, IUD myometrium, IUD fundus were all measured as well. And there was no relationship between the IUD uh, and the symptoms or IUD localization and, and, light and, and those distances and the symptoms. And their conclusion was if ultrasound were to be performed in T-shaped IUD users, the IUD myometrium distance is likely to be most reliable measurement. Um, and, that's, uh, and, and that's because the, the, uh, the other measurements can, can vary because the, the, um, the endometrium throughout the menstrual cycle can vary in thickness. So that would, uh, that would change the distance to the um, to the to the endometrium and to the uh, to the serosa. And Tebi um, looked at 123 patients with copper IUDs, and the um, the odds ratio for a woman with an intracervical IUD to become pregnant compared with a woman with an IUD in the uterus was 13.93, which is very high. Um, so in copper IUDs, cer a cervical um, uh, cervically located Copper IUD is associated with an increased risk of, uh, of failure. Amos Baird uh, looked at 18 patients where the levonorgestrel IUD was found to be displaced towards the cervical canal uh, two to 36 months post insertion. And they tried to uh, reposition those IUDs. They used a, an, an alligator forceps to push that IUD back into the cavity. And they found that they were able to do that in 94% of the time or 17 out of 18 uh, uh, patients. But uh, when they did a follow-up uh, ultrasound, they found that in three of them, the IUD was again malpositioned uh, at two months. But they didn't have any complications or, or infections that were reported. And their conclusion was repositioning of a malpositioned levonorgestrel releasing IUD um, should be considered as it is an easy and simple manipulation that can be done in the office with a high success rate and minimal risk of complications. So should IUDs be inserted under ultrasound guidance? You know, typically ultrasound guidance is, uh, is reserved for women with a history of difficult insertion, obesity that limits by manual exam, stenotic cervix, or suspected of having some kind of distortion of the uterine cavity, either by a fibroid or um, malaria anomaly. Bolica um, looked at uh, C7 patients that were referred for IUD insertion guided uh, with the transabdominal sonography after unsuccessful attempts in the office. And their success rate of inserting it uh, under ultrasound guidance was 83.6%. And they noted that the failure uh, was A, patient discomfort during the procedure, cervical stenosis, or inability to remove and replace the existing, existing device. Uh, Dackley uh, did a, a randomized uh, controlled trial on 102 eligible females. They were randomly assigned into transabdominal guided IUD insertion, 51 patients, versus traditional IUD insertion uh, where they did not use um, um, uh, ultrasound. And their main outcome was pain. Um, and they noted that in the, in the ultrasound group, uh, they had lower pain scores, 2.4 versus, uh, versus 5 in the patients that did not have an ultrasound. And, uh, and, and also the time taken for IUD insertion was, was lower in the, um, in, in the ultrasound group versus the um, traditional group. It was 32 seconds in the um, ultrasound group versus 77 seconds 
in the um, uh, group that did not have um, ultrasound guidance. And their conclusion was due to the decrease in pain and time taken for IUD insertion, the transabdominal guided technique can be used as a modified technique for IUD insertion. So this was a patient that uh, we had uh, um, that we had seen. She had a, a malpositioned IUD, as you can see down here, the shadow. This is uh, the top of the uterus. You see the IUD. So this this ID was removed, and then we did a and it, the uterus was retro retro uh, birded. So we did the um, the ID insertion under ultrasound guidance, um, and you know you, you see that it is it was placed adequately at the time of insertion. IV localization, do we need 3D ultrasound or is 2D sufficient? Lee et al. looked at 96 women with copper IUD. They did 3D ultrasound on all of them, and they noted that visualization of all parts of the IUD was possible in 91 out of 96, or 95% of cases. In two cases, it was incomplete opening of the two arms of the device was demonstrated. One case had the IUD in the cervical canal, and one case the IUD was in the correct location, however, with a pregnancy. And their conclusion was, 3D ultrasound enables imaging of the entire IUD, i.e. the shaft and the arms simultaneously. Additionally, the examination time can be kept to a minimum with this new technique. Beryl Benassaraf and, and her team um, looked at um, uh, 3D ultrasound and, and they noted that out of 167 patients with an IUD that presented for 3D ultrasound, 28 or 16.8% were abnormally positioned. 21 out of those 28 or 75 percent of patients with an abnormally located IUD had either excessive bleeding, pain, or both, compared to the 38 uh, out of 139, 34 percent with appropriately located IUD. And then 21 patients had them removed, and 20 of those that showed significant clinical improvement after removal. So perhaps abnormally located IUD um, uh, symptomatology. Um, should be taken into account. Moscos, however, they reviewed um, uh, 269 patients with an IUD, 180 with copper, 59 with levonorgestrel releasing IUD, and three uh, lipids loop. And they, they noted that 27 IDs were excluded because they were not seen on ultrasound or the type of ID was not identifiable. They rated the sonographic uh, characteristic of the IUD as uh, uh, on a conspicu uh, conspicuity score which was very interesting. Um, they noted properly positioned uh, IUDs in 74%, malpositioned in 25%, and they could not be confirmed in about 1%. The ultrasound indication was pain in 46%, missing uh, strings 38% and bleeding in 14%. Of the patients who presented with bleeding, the IUD was malpositioned in 38% of the time. On 2D, the conspicuity score for copper IUDs was significantly higher at 5.3 compared to levonorgestrel releasing IUDs, which was 3.1. However, when 3D was, was used, the difference was marginally uh, significant with copper IUDs at 6.6 .6 versus levonorgestrel at 6.2. So it kind of shows you that perhaps 3D ultrasound is better at visualizing, especially the levonorgestrel uh, releasing IUDs. And their conclusion was levonorgestrel releasing IUD is significantly less conspicuous than copper IUDs on 2D imaging. 3D ultrasound, enhances the conspicuity of both types of IUDs. Chen did a, a study on 3D versus 2D ultrasonography uh, on IUDs as well. And this was a prospective study. The women with a history of failed IUD removal and or, and or uh, ultrasound showing malpositioned IUD. They went 2D and 3D sonography. And in their, in, in their cohort, they did hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, or even laparotomy IUDs. So that they, and they used that as the gold standard uh, to localize the IUD, and they, then they compared the ultrasound findings. 130 participants, 128 were diagnosed with IUD malposition, and then the malposition had been correctly identified with the 2D in 65% of cases, and with the 3D in about 83 to 84% of cases, and that was significantly higher in the 3D. And their conclusion was the use of 2D ultrasonography is recommended for the follow-up of women who use IUDs as a contraceptive method. However, 3D ultrasonography should be used when malposition is suspected. Can we avoid malpositioning? Well, we'll just make, um, did a multi-center study with 410 nulliparous women to measure the width of the uterine cavity. We're using 2D and 3D ultrasound. 
The mean width of the uh, uterine cavity in the fundus was 22 millimeters. And there was no statistical difference in the values whether determined by 2D or 3D. So the width measured by 2D or 3D was the same, was, was, uh, uh, was, was, was similar. 79% of women had uterine cavities between 15 and 28 millimeters. But look at this. 32% had less than 20 millimeters and 6.8% had a had a uh, endometrial width of less than 15 millimeters. So are we placing appropriate IUDs is the question. So Benasaraf uh, and her team, again, uh, they measured the endometrial width in patients with embedded IUDs using 3D ultrasound compared to normal uh, normal location IUDs. And they, they looked at 172 women. Um, measurement of the width of the endometrial cavity was, was performed in 132 with non-embedded IUDs and 29 with embedded IUDs. The mean and standard, de and standard deviation values of the fundus of the cavity with the non-embedded and embedded IUDs were 32 versus 25. So which tells you that those that are embedded had seemed to have a, a smaller width of their uh, endometrial cavity. And their conclusion was patients with embedded IUDs have a smaller fundal endometrial uh, diameter compared to those with normally placed IUDs as documented using 3D rendering of the uterus. Whether pre-procedural 3D sonography of, uh, for women who are IUD candidates would be uh, useful deserves further study. We did a pilot study on the angle of rotation of the uterus at the fundus from horizontal using 3D sonography uh, because we uh, we wanted to see whether the, the fundus is rotated or whether it's in a, in a plane, three to nine o'clock plane. We looked at 51 uh, patients the median, we looked at the median uh, cervical vaginal angle, and that cervical vaginal angle was 122 among those patients. And then we looked at the, the, uh, the angle of rotation from the horizontal. So we did that on, on the B plane and on the C plane. And, um, and it was uh, the rotation uh, on the B plane was 10.4% uh, degrees with a maximal angle of 43 degrees. And on the coronal plane, it was 10 degrees with a maximal angle of 43 degrees. So when we are assuming, when we insert IUDs, we assume a three to nine uh, o'clock uh, position and you open your IUD in a three to nine o'clock position, but what if it is not a three to nine o'clock? What if, what if you're opening at three to nine o'clock and the uterus at the fundus is rotated either clockwise or counterclockwise, you would be opening the IUD um, into the myometrium. And so the conclusion was contrary to traditional thinking, the uterus can be rotated at the fundus in relation to the body along the uh, longitudinal axis of the cervical canal. So real briefly, is 2D sufficient? Just a few cases. You see this on, on 2D, this is on 3D. You see how, how 3D may be a little uh, superior to, to 2D. You see hyperechogenicity here at the, at the fundus, but you see much better image on a 3D to know exactly where the arms are. And again, on 2D, you see the hyperechogenicity here reaching the, the fundus but you see it uh, really nicely where the arms are open and you see the IUD strings coming down through the cervix. You see here that perhaps the, uh, the uh, echogenicity is a little lower than the fundus and you can see it really nicely. And, and this was the, where the IUD strings are, are coiled up inside the cavity. Here you can see that the, the, um, the IUD is, it seems to be a little low, uh, perhaps too low. And you can see definitely that it's very low on the 3D where it's really uh, inside the cervical canal. And again, here, it looks like it's very low inside the, um, the cervix. And you can see that it's, there's nothing inside the cavity. And you can see the shadow, at least, of the IUD uh, down here in the, in, the, in the cavity. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. You see that the, the echogenicity, it seems to be at the, um, at the fundus. But, and and you're, you, you may be reassured by this. But then you do a 3D ultrasound. And you can see this is the cavity here. You can see that the IUD did not open and is actually just lodged into the um, right coronal region and did not open up into where it's supposed to be inside the cavity. It's just inside the coronal right here. And again, you can see here where you can see the, um, the echogenicity reaching perhaps the, the top, but when you do the 3D uh, image, you see that the IUD is actually upside down inside the cavity, uh, pointing uh, downwards rather than sitting and pointing upwards. So is 2D sufficient? Um, I think it's. Uh, I think we're we're still uh, needing some more um, studies to decide whether it is sufficient or not. And um, just going to briefly tell you about a, a case, interesting case that we had. This was a 30-year-old G1P1 woman with secondary infertility and abnormal uterine bleeding ovulatory type for the past five years. She was referred for a hyperechoic structure in the uterus of unknown etiology. There was no history of uterine surgery and no uh, and and she had prior uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery and her pregnancy test was negative. 
this is what the, um, the ultrasound looks like. You have this um, transverse, you see the endometrium, you see this hyperechogenic structure near the endometrium. And you can see it here again, you see the hyperechogenic structure here. On 3D, you see the top of the uterus. This is the, um, uh, the uh, right coronal region. You see the hyperechogenic structure seems to be perhaps starting within the endometrium going past uh, here in, inside the myometrium. And this is tomographic uh, sonography. And you can see this structure that is sitting perhaps in the right coronal region and going um, out into the, um, into the myometrium. We did, a, we did a hysteroscopy and we were looking for this structure. Uh, the patient initially did not give history of, a, of an IUD. The, uh, after the fact, she gave us a history of an IUD. Uh, we went in to try to see, we dissected out that area. We could not find that, uh, that structure. We went laparoscopically and we saw this loop of bowel. This is the uterus, see the loop of bowel stuck to the backside of the, um, of the uterus. And so we called in general surgery and we told them that there's a structure that may be connected um, uh, a hyperechogenic structure that's maybe connected into this, uh, this loop of bowel. They dissected it out and, and here you see the IUD, you see where the uh, loop of bowel is sitting here, and this is the um, anerotomy, you see the beginning of the strings of the IUD there, and, um, and so they repaired the anerotomy. The patient did very well, but looking back, you can see here that, the, that this structure is um, pointing outside of the uterus, and you can see here, this is actually a typical looking um, uh, bowel uh, where you have the hypoechogenic structure and then hi hyperechogenic uh, structures. So this is very typical looking of a bowel. And so um, this was an IUD that perforated and went into bowel. So conclusion, the metallic microinsert is readily imaged by ultrasound. TVU confirmation test for the metallic microinsert can be offered to some patients who meet eligibility criteria. HSG remains the mainstay of confirmation. There is little published evidence to determine the true impact and clinical re relevance of downwardly displaced IUDs. Levonorgestrel releasing malposition IUDs within the endometrial cavity can be left in place in asymptomatic patients. Malposition copper IUDs can be associated with slightly higher pregnancy rate and patients should be counseled about that fact. In the appropriate patient and if deemed technically possible, perhaps an attempt at readjusting the IUD position can be considered. The decision to remove a malpositioned IUD should take into consideration the clinical presentation, the patient's contraceptive needs, and the risk of pregnancy with and without the IUD. If a malpositioned IUD removal is contemplated in a patient with continued contraceptive need, then immediate ultrasound-guided IUD replacement should be performed or another form of birth control should be initiated. Thank you for, for being with us and joining us, and we'll take a couple of questions uh, So Dr. Sakal, there's one question right now that I see. Okay, so we have a so we have a question. Uh, the question is, can you describe the steps you, uh, you, you the steps you perform in obtaining a coronal 3D uh, transvaginal um, ultrasound. So the steps to to, uh, to, to get the coronal image, um, I would refer you to, to a, uh, a great article by Dr. Um, Alfred Abahamad on, uh, on the Z technique. And um, so the, the, ac the acquisition of the volume for the coronal image is typically in, in the uh, mid-sagittal plane. Um, and then you um, then the, uh, the software will open up your three orthogonal planes. And what you want to do is you align, uh, you start with the A plane, which is the mid-sagittal. You align the, um, the, um, the, long, the, the length of the endometrium. You align it with the horizontal on A plane. Then you go to the B plane and then align the endometrial, uh, 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 the endometrium with the horizontal as well. And at that point, if you look at your C plane, which is really your, 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 your Z plane, um, that coronal plane, you will have at that point, typically the, um, the coronal plane starting to show up really well for you. And then you just you will have to do just minimal manipulation from that point to get a good coronal plane. Um, do you have time for one more question? Yes, absolutely. Okay.
So the question is, um, is 3D ultrasound standard of care for IUD malposition? In other words, if I order an ultrasound for suspected malposition, will 3D be done automatically? Unfortunately, it will not be done automatically. It depends on the, um, the uh, sonographer or the sonologist um, that's performing the, uh, the ultrasound and their capability of doing 3D. Um, I've seen many times in emergency departments where you know, there's suspicion for possibly you know, uh, um, uh, IUD mal malpositioning and only a 2D ultrasound is performed and the, the report will say, um, you know, noted in the correct uh, position inside the uterus, but there's no mention of 3D being performed, no mention of the arms, no, men no, no, no mention of, uh, of embeddedment. Uh, we um, published a, uh, an article as, um, as part of a task force on um, 3D ultrasound, um, and so I'll refer you to that uh, article, um, and, uh, and, and, and it does mention um, how 3D ultrasound and ultrasound in general should be first line, especially for IUD um, localization. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of the AIUM, our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone. <laughs>